Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Fong, and I'm a research coordinator here at the Alfred Wegener Institute, located in Bremerhaven, Germany. I'm also the Mosaic Ecosystems Coordinator, and so my interest and my role in Mosaic is to cover all of the things that fall under the umbrella of ecological processes and functions. And ecology is really at the intersection of both physics and chemistry. So today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Arctic Ocean, nutrient biogeochemistry, its distribution of nutrients in the Arctic Ocean, and how that influences primary production that we hope to be able to observe during Mosaic. So firstly, let's take a look at what types of physical currents control the introduction and export of nutrients from the Arctic. As you may know, the Arctic Ocean is the smallest ocean, but it's very unique and dynamic because it's surrounded by several continents. So while it's small, its contribution to global climate is ever increasing with global warming. So things that we're looking at are not just the introduction of nutrients from the Pacific and Atlantic oceans, but also the contribution of nutrients and organic matter from terrestrial systems. So from the land masses that surround the Arctic. There are large rivers flowing into the Arctic, and with them, they bring sediments, organic matter, and nutrients. So when we think about what are the distributions of nutrients in the Arctic, we have to consider all of the inputs and outputs. This includes both terrestrial sources as well as oceanic sources. So let's first look at some of the currents. We have a distribution of primary currents from both the Atlantic and the Pacific. In the Atlantic, warm, salty water flows in through the Fram Strait. From the Pacific, we have cold nutrient water coming through the Bering Strait. Together, these currents bring about a change in the ratio of nutrients to one another. And what we do is we study what the proportion of these nutrients are in different regions of the Arctic to understand their distribution and how that distribution supports primary productivity. So in addition to the lateral transport of nutrients into the Arctic from both terrestrial systems and the inlet of the Bering Strait and the Fram Strait to the Atlantic and Pacific, we have to consider what the vertical distribution of nutrients are in the ocean. So currents not only move water laterally, but they move water vertically. And so one way of understanding what might control nutrients is the temperature and solidity of seawater. And in the Arctic Ocean, you also have to think about the layer of ice that exists on top of the ocean, which does have an influence on the vertical structure. But two factors that we look at as oceanographers are temperature and salinity. And so in general, the Arctic has very cold surface water temperatures. And as you move through the water column, so move deeper into the ocean, we encounter a slightly warmer layer known as Atlantic water. So the movement of a large mass and volume of ocean water that's saltier and warmer than surface polar water that comes into the Arctic with it comes nutrients, and it has a different nutrient profile than polar water. And then at the deep ocean, there are other currents bringing in cold, salty water below the warm Atlantic water. So while we've discussed how temperature and salinity changes in vertical space, one thing we also have to consider is the seasonal variation of temperature in the Arctic. Many of you will associate the Arctic with a frozen landscape, and for a majority of the ocean, that is true. The Arctic experiences large expanses of sea ice cover during the late fall and winter months into the spring. And so the ocean not only acts as a liquid medium for nutrients, but there's a semi-solid medium of sea ice where nutrients are also important. And so what we need to consider in understanding Arctic Ocean biogeochemistry is understanding what role sea ice plays in changing the inventory and fluxes of essential nutrients. So you're probably wondering, what are those things that you keep calling nutrients? Is there something in my everyday life that I can relate to? And my best explanation is the nutrients I'm talking about are the same types of nutrients that your garden at home needs. The plants that grow in your garden need things like nitrate, phosphate, and sometimes other trace elements. And it's nitrate and phosphate and these trace elements that combine together to support their growth. 
This is exactly the same type of nutrients that are needed by ocean plants like phytoplankton and sea ice alga. And of course, just like in your home garden, the Arctic Ocean and the community that uses those nutrients experience seasonal changes. When we are working in the Arctic, we're both looking at summertime productivity and wintertime preconditions of nutrients. And Mosaic is an opportunity for us to look at that complete annual cycle within one year, which is unprecedented in modern sea ice studies. So first, let's consider this. Let's start in September. It's September in the Arctic. The light is just barely coming over the horizon, but there's still enough light for productivity. And the question that's pressing is, is there enough nutrients within the water column for phytoplankton and sea ice algae to continue to grow? We are studying this actively, not just in Mosaic, but as part of Arctic community research. We're moving past September into the late fall, October and November. And what has happened is the sunlight has disappeared. And when there is no sunlight, organisms like phytoplankton and sea ice algae can no longer photosynthesize. They need sunlight and nutrients to photosynthesize. And when the light disappears, they begin to enter a dormant stage. What happens to the nutrients? In the upper water column, the nutrients remain and things that are even smaller than sea ice algae, like bacteria, begin to take that organic matter and recycle it. And when that happens, it releases nutrients back into the water column and back into the ice. So one thing in these dark months, these dark and cold months that's happening is a combination of both chemical reactions and biological reactions to reintroduce nutrients into both the water column and sea ice. But biology is not the only thing that controls nutrient distributions. In the wintertime, there are many storms and wind events. And what can happen is that these storm and wind events turn or mix the upper ocean. And just like there are large currents moving large volumes of water, these events like storms actually reintroduce nutrients from the deep sea into the surface water where there had been recently depleted nutrients because of phytoplankton growth. So our previous knowledge was that very little was happening in the winter. And what we have found with our modern observations is that there's actually a lot of activity happening in the winter. And so what we're trying to focus on now is the coupling between microbial processes and nutrient biogeochemistry to understand what those inventories of nutrients in the upper ocean may actually be like before the onset of new growth in the spring and summer in the Arctic Ocean. So after a long, cold, and dark winter, the sun begins to return. And in Mosaic, in the Central Arctic, we anticipate the sun to return in late February and into mid-March. It really depends where we are in the drift, but we know that the sun will return. And what this means is that it is like a wake-up call to all of the small organisms that utilize light. In addition, over this winter period, we know that nutrients have been regenerated and resupplied to waters and to ice layers where they had been depleted with the previous summer's growth. That being said, now the question is, what are the existing nutrient concentrations and their ratios to one another before sea ice algae and phytoplankton begin their rapid growth as soon as light returns. And this is a critical thing that we're trying to understand all across the Arctic. Each region, given its different contributions of sources of nutrients and differences in microbial communities, means that the Arctic is experiencing different rates of change and how nutrients influence primary production. In the central Arctic, which has historically been covered with multi-year ice, we anticipate that productivity will remain very low, but our sea ice physics uh, observations indicate that sea ice is continuing to retreat. The onset of melt is earlier in the year, the onset of freezing is later in the year, and what this creates is a very large period of time when light is available, where ice is thin or non-existent. And what this allows is for small microorganisms like phytoplankton and sea ice algae to utilize now nutrients and light to grow.